Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Philip Eidus. I'm an associate professor of security studies at the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Belgrade. And today I'm going to talk about the secession of Kosovo and Serbia's ontological security. Before I proceed, I would um, like to thank again uh, Professor Belloni and the University of Trento for the invitation. It's a great pleasure. So this uh, presentation is based on my uh, recent book, which I published with uh, Paul Gerrit Macmillan, called, as you can see, Crisis and Ontological Security, Serbia's Anxiety over Kosovo's Secession. And in this presentation, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to give you the gist of the book. The key puzzle uh, which um, has motivated my research is as following. 20 years since the war, Serbia continues to fiercely oppose the independence of Kosovo without offering any viable alternative. This policy enjoys wide popular support and cross-party consensus, despite the fact that it has achieved very little success and incurred great economic, political, and reputational cost for Serbia. How can this be explained? And uh, these are my key arguments or key findings. First, although Serbia's Kosovo policy may seem irrational or even schizophrenic at times, it can be understood as an attempt to maintain biographical continuity in the face of secession of what I call an ontic space, a material extension of the national self. Second, Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence in 2008 created an ontological insecurity and a state of collective anxiety in Serbia. Three, in order to maintain biographical continuity and a healthy sense of collective self, Serbian leaders made a vow never to recognize the independence of Kosovo. And finally, this policy discourse has been at odds with Serbia's foreign policy priorities of joining the EU. And to cope with this dissonance, Serbia resorted to a mechanism of avoidance. This is the rest of my presentation. It will unfold as follows. First of all, I will say a few words about the theory of ontological security. Uh, then I will talk about the historic process, how Kosovo became uh, an ontic space uh, of the Serbian nation state. And then in the last uh, two sections, I will analyze empirically, first of all, the, the crisis, which was generated by the unilateral declaration of independence in 2008, and then later on the di dissonance uh, between Serbia's Kosovo and European policies and how Serbia coped with it through avoidance. Uh, let me first start with um, some general remarks about ontological security as a theory. The concept of ontological security um, originated in psychology. It was uh, coined by Scottish psychiatrist Lang. Then it traveled to sociology through the works of Anthony Giddens and was um, translated into a concept of international relations uh, in the late 90s and um, you know, in the first decade of the, the, this century by authors such as uh, Katarina Kinwell, Jennifer Mitzen, Brent Steele, and others. Ontological security, as Giddens uh, define it, um, means a confidence that most human beings have in the continuity of their self-identity and in the constancy of the surrounding social and material environments of action. Most um, ontological security scholars uh, focused on the social uh, part of this definition, whereas in my study, I've also theorized um, this material environment through the development of the concept of ontic space, a material extension of uh, self. Now, while physical security, a traditional purview of um, international relations scholarship, is about fear, ontological security is about anxiety. Fear has a very concrete object which is threatening you. For instance, it can be coronavirus. Anxiety is something which is stemming from within. It's, um, it, it's this sense of unease um, which is generated by the inability uh, of either an individual or collective to sustain their daily routines uh, and also to kind of uh, maintain their biographical continuities. Um, let me 
illustrate you this difference in the example of the current corona crisis. Um, we are all now, uh, you know, fearing the virus because uh, virus can kill us, right? But what is maybe even more disturbing is this indeterminacy and the uncertainty which is created by the virus as to whether we will be able to go on with our daily routines, whether liberal democracy will survive, whether globalization um, will uh, be the same again, whether we will be able to return to our daily routines and hence whether we will be able to, uh, you know, stay through to ourselves in the future. Uh, and this is the difference between fear and anxiety. And ontological security scholarship argues that anxiety is more debilitating and sometimes more important to both individual and collective actors such as states than fear. That states, just like individuals, are sometimes uh, ready to sacrifice their physical security if it can lead to the protection of ontological security. Ontological security is maintained through the routinization of relationships with significant others at the individual level. It can be friends, family, um, people whom you work with uh, or whom, with whom you uh, quarrel and argue. Uh, at the international level for states, it can be friends, enemies, uh, partners, etc which helps actors create a protective cocoon and bracket out fundamental questions of existence, finitude, relations, and biography. Uh, normally, when an agent is ontologically secure, she or he does not raise those fundamental questions because they're debilitating and can uh, prevent an agent from uh, being a purposeful act actor. Uh, once this protective cocoon is pierced and once uh, he or she cannot continue with his, his or her daily routines, then those fundamental questions burst out on, into the open and they demand some sort of uh, answer or a new narrative which is going to uh, recover uh, ontological security. Ontological security is unmade by those critical situations which pierce the protective cocoon. Uh, which are defined as a set of circumstances which, for whatever reason, radically disrupt custom routines of daily life. Now, I argue in the book that Kosovo is considered to be Serbia's uh, ontic space or this core territory, a material environment of action which has been construed as, as um, you know, crucial for national identity. As Vuk Jeremic, former Serbia's foreign minister, said in 2011, and it applies to, to basically uh, mainstream public discourse um, in Serbia today, um, Kosovo, I quote, is our Valley Forge and Yorktown, our Alamo and Gettysburg, our Pearl Harbor and Iwo Jima all rolled into one. It is in our dreams at night and in our prayers in church. It is the apple of our eye. It is our Jerusalem. Now, I explain in my book how this um, ontic space was constructed historically. Um, and we don't have the time here to uh, say everything about it or everything which is, uh, you know, uh, detailed. But uh, let me just, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Serbian history, remind you that um, in 1389, Serbian and or Christian forces faced the Ottoman uh, invading army in Kosovo. Uh, and um, in the Serbian collective memory, Serbia was defeated terribly only because the Serbian Prince Lazar, on the eve of the battle, um, in his dreams, he was, um, according to the myth, he was visited by an eagle, an emissary of God, uh, who flew from Jerusalem and visited him and offered Prince Lazar a choice between heavenly kingdom and earthly kingdom. If Prince Lazar was to accept heavenly kingdom, he would lose the battle but win the heavens. Uh, and vice versa, if he was to uh, accept the earthly kingdom, he would, uh, you know, win against the Ottoman forces on the battlefield, but he would lose the heavens. And according to the myth, Prince Lazar, uh, chose the heavenly kingdom and the Serbs became the heavenly people, so to speak. It's the only moment in Serbian history when God addressed 
Serbs directly, according to the myth. It's comparable to, uh, you know, the God giving Ten Commandments to Moses uh, in Mount Sinai. Uh, so it's, it's a sort of theophany moment when the God appears to the nation and makes it a heavenly people. Um, and the, throughout the Middle Ages, this story was inspiring Serbian uh, minstrels and the Serbian Orthodox Church kept the memory of it. And in the 19th century, when the nation was um, being invented, if you will, uh, the Kosovo myth was used by nationalists to, to inspire this national self-awakening. But it wasn't a territorial myth. Only later on in the late 19th century, uh, due to wider geopolitical, you know, um, shifts that were occurring at the time, uh, Serbia basically decided to um, build this aspiration to incorporate all, also the territory of Kosovo inside uh, the territory of Serbia. Eventually it happened in uh, 1912 um, after the Balkan Wars when, when Kosovo became part of Serbia. Kosovo which was and still is populated by um, mostly by Kosovo Muslim Albanians. And then throughout the 20th century this Kosovo myth waxed and waned uh, especially during the communist period it uh, was repressed and communist authorities didn't really uh, encourage people from um, you know using this uh, Kosovo mythology because it could uh, inspire nationalism and undermine brotherhood and unity which was needed as uh, the, 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 the you know the core of the socialist federative republic of Yugoslavia but as the federal state uh, started to crumble at the end of the cold war uh, Serbian politicians um, seized this uh, story again to mobilize uh, people and rally it around the flag. And uh, the first big politician who, who used it was actually a communist apparatchik, Slobodan Milosevic, who uh, rose basically to power in the late uh, 1980s on the wave of the Kosovo mythology. In um, June 1989, he staged this massive, some people say up to one million people, uh, attended it um, rally in the Kosovo uh, field and uh, at the place where the the battlefield took uh, took place in 1389 uh, and uh, in his now infamous speech which you can see on YouTube or, or read online basically Slobodan Milosevic revived the Kosovo mythology big time and um, he he even threatened that uh, armed struggles are uh, possible uh, if it will be needed for Serbia to keep control over Kosovo. Because not only Kosovo, but all other republics and autonomous provinces uh, started going their way and uh, wanted to secede from the crumbling, uh, in imploding federal state. Uh, throughout the 1990s, uh, Serbia um, operated a system in Kosovo which uh, was described by Human Rights Watch at the time as, uh, you know, ethnic repression and uh, discrimination, um, which basically uh, peaked in, in, in late 1990s. In 1998, uh, 1997, uh, Kosovo Albanians started uh, an armed struggle against um, uh, authorities in Belgrade. Um, Belgrade responded with a very tough um, kind of uh, counterinsurgency campaign, uh, not really discriminating between civilians and uh, combatants, um, leading to humanitarian uh, catastrophe, which uh, motivated NATO to intervene in March uh, 1989. And after 78 of 78 days of uh, bombing, um, Serbian forces were kicked out of Kosovo and the international um, you know, community moved in with KFOR and UNMIC as, uh, as key poles of authority which, which took over from the Yugoslav and Serbian authorities. Most people in the West and diplomats but also many liberal people in Serbia believe that um, Milosevic was the problem. If we get rid of Milosevic Serbia will change its policy towards Kosovo and will come to terms with the fact that Kosovo is no longer a part of Serbia and that Kosovo Albanians basically do not want 
to live um, inside Serbia any longer. Uh, in October 2000, um, we managed to get rid of Milosevic. This is a photo which was took in front of the uh, federal parliament in Belgrade. I was there. I was uh, one of the protesters, one of uh, many thousands of people who took to the streets to defend the electoral will because Milosevic um, tried to rig the elections. Um, why? Um, there is a bulldozer because um, this guy came with a bulldozer. He wanted to bulldoze the, the parliament and bulldoze the, 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 the TV station. This is why many people um, call this revolution a bulldozer revolution. And uh, what happened is that Milosevic was ousted, but this whole narrative about Kosovo as Serbia's sacred land uh, survived. And uh, Serbia, continued its, um, you know, non-recognition policy, its insistence on territorial integrity and sovereignty, its insistence on the UN Security Council Resolution 1244, it's the resolution which basically put an end to the war in 1989, and according to which uh, Kosovo is legally a part of um, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, which, uh, by the way, uh, ceased to exist a few years later in 2006 when Montenegro seceded from Serbia, Yugoslav state was no longer. But still Serbia as the legal successor of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia uh, argues that um, Kosovo legally still uh, belongs to, to, to Serbia. Uh, also, Serbia continued its reliance on the support of Russia, uh, Russian Federation, with the arrival of Putin, uh, became way more assertive, not only in the Balkans, but elsewhere, as you uh, are well aware. Um, and um, continue, Russia continues to veto in the United Nations Security Council, or threaten to veto any change of the UN Security Council Resolution 1244, which would legally change the status of Kosovo, despite the situation on the ground. Um, um, and the only novelty in the post-2000 uh, period is the fact that Serbia renounced the use of force and uh, started relying solely on diplomatic and uh, legal means. Uh, from 2006 to 2007, the UN mediated um, talks um, and the mediator, the special um, envoy of the uh, United, United Nations, uh, Marti Artisari, former uh, Finnish president, um, mediated those talks and uh, he issued uh, the Artisari plan in 2007, which uh, Serbia rejected. Uh, fiercely and uh, basically the UN talks failed. When the UN talks failed, um, Kosovo authorities moved to the so-called Plan B and the Plan B was to unilaterally declare independence, which happened on 17th of February 2008 uh, to the dismay of Belgrade authorities. Serbia um, rejected this move as an affront to Serbian constitution, but also international law and the international system as such. A um, few days later, on 21st of February 2008, Serbian government, um, but also opposition attended it, organized another massive rally in front of the Serbian parliament, a scene where uh, the, the, the revolution of 2000 took place, if you remember from the previous photo. And uh, basically all politicians of the day took uh, the stage and um, talked angrily about um, the Kosovo's move. And uh, the then president, uh, Boris Tadic, in a uh, later interview with me, told me the following. The UDI was immediately producing fundamental uncertainty within the nation. And as a psychologist, I was aware of this. I was particularly struck by this awareness that every citizen was facing a state of uncertainty, anxiety, and unease. Um, that night, um, a group of hooligans also demolished uh, the American embassy, set it on fire, many other uh, public buildings uh, in the city. It was really a moment that one sociologist described as um, a siege. Serbia was infected by this siege mentality. 
that um, incorporates beliefs that the entire world is uh, against you and that uh, you are the only just um, actor in the world that the entire uh, cosmos basically is crumbling and falling apart but that you're kind of uh, all alone standing uh, against all odds um, now, this uh, situation created a um, deep sense of anxiety, as, as uh, President Tadic uh, described, and I uh, unpacked it into four different uh, domains. The first one is this question of existence, um, the question of firmness and continuity of the external world. And there are many examples and illustrations uh, that uh, show that uh, this question of existence all of a sudden overwhelmed Serbian public discourse. Um, I will just give you one uh, piece of example. Prime Minister Kostunica, uh, on the day after, uh, one day after the unilateral de declaration of independence, said the following, yesterday's illegal act violated the UN Charter Resolution 1244, Final Helsinki Act, and all international legal norms upon which the world order is founded. Basically, in the eyes of the Serbian political elite and also majority of people uh, in Serbia, basically the whole world was falling apart, so to speak. The world society was falling apart. The core principles of the world society uh, were violated um, and uh, basically uh, the, the, the international uh, institutions and international community um, basically was disintegrating in front of our eyes. The second uh, dimension of um, any critical situation is this question of finitude, question of ending, question um, whether the future uh, you know, will be uh, and um, what kind of future waits for us. Uh, and the, the future of the Serbian polity was really uh, brought into question. I just give you here one example. Um, it's a speech, a very, very inspired speech, which um, uh, Foreign Minister Bukjeremic uh, gave on 20th of February of 2008 at the U European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. He says, I quote, where we are is at the precipice, facing down into the shadows of uncertainty uncertainty over the future of the Western Balkans, uncertainty over democracy in Serbia, uncertainty over the safety of the Kosovo Serbs, and uncertainty over the fate of our holy sites, the central element of our national identity. And similar examples of the question of finitude bursting into the open um, are you know, uh, numerous and I give them in my book. Then another, the third dimension of uh, any critical situation is the disturbed relationship with uh, significant others. When you lose friends or even lose enemies, the loss of enemy can be as debilitating as the loss of a friend. And David Campbell in his book, Writing Security, discussed it. And um, uh, you, you know how the West, after the end of the Cold War, uh, kind of lost uh, a little bit a sense of purpose because uh, when the Soviet Union imploded, especially the US as the leader of the West, uh, engaged in the quest for a new enemy uh, and for a new challenge, uh, which was eventually found after 9-11 in uh, the guise of uh, Islamic fundamentalism. Um, in Serbia, something similar occurred um, after the unilateral declaration of independence because many countries that Serbia considered to be its friends, i.e. most EU countries, overnight transformed into the most vicious enemies who recognized um, this illegal secession of Kosovo. Um, the U.S. was compared to the Ottoman Empire and Vojslav Kostunica on one occasion said that the new battle of Kosovo is being fought between now the United States of America as the most powerful actor and Serbia. In this particular um, quote, uh, at the rally, we don't 
Give Kosovo, which was uh, held on the 21st of February, which I mentioned earlier, he said the following, is there another nation in the world from whom the mighty powers ask to renounce itself, as is the case with Serbia? We are not alone in this fight. The Serbian people will not forget the friendship and principled support of the Russian President Putin, because Russia at the moment was uh, really the only country which um, seemed and appeared as a true friend. Everybody else, all other special relationships and all other, also neighboring countries like uh, brotherly nations of Montenegro uh, recognized Kosovo. It was uh, depicted in the press as a stab in the back. Uh, Macedonia too. Basically everybody uh, left Serbia in the cold and um, there was only Russia uh, which uh, came across as the only true friend and, and, and a country which basically, and this relationship with Russia was a source of ontological security because every, all other friendships were withering away. And then finally, the last dimension of ontological insecurity created by the independence of Kosovo by this um, act of secession was this ruptured sense of continuity. Uh, Serbs were asked to, you know, give up what they consider to be the holy land, the sacred space, uh, and to basically uh, give up their own uh, identity. And uh, this is a speech which um, Prime Minister Kostunica gave at the United Nations Security Council uh, before the secession, but uh, after Marti Ahtisari's rejection plan, uh, rejected plan, and when uh, Serbia anticipated that uh, something like the UDI will, um, will be adopted. He said, I quote, the dignity of my country and of my people is inseparable from Kosovo and Metohia, where our state, our religion, our culture, and our national and state identity were born. Now, I didn't have the time to discuss the historical accuracy of this claim that uh, Serbia's uh, state um, and culture were born on the territory of Kosovo. This is simply not historically true. The first Serbian polity was established in the region of Raška, which is not uh, in Kosovo, but um, historical accuracy is not something that um, national mythologies and national um, nationalist politicians uh, really uh, care much for. Um, this idea that the Kosovo is the cradle of the Serbian nation is widely uh, held belief by politicians and citizens alike. And uh, the, the act of secession, the unilateral declaration of independence, challenged this sense of biographical continuities. Um, Serbia considers itself as a nation which was born in Kosovo, which uh, was, you know, addressed by God, if you will, in Kosovo, and that that has to stick to this Kosovo narrative, narrative if it wants to uh, go on and to maintain a, a healthy sense of self. Um, now, all this... Um, generated uh, a great deal of anxiety uh, because the questions of existence, finitude, um, relations and biography flooded the public discourse. Politicians needed to uh, reclaim ontological security or, or to, to recover, to repair, and uh, hence to fend off um, collective anxieties. And in my interview with Boris Tadic, um, he, you know, I asked him how, how did he cope with this situation and he said the following thing, I quote, in that moment I put an effort to define a state policy which can make people feel secure as much as possible. Let them know that they are not all alone and that we will take care of what is essentially an identity problem. When I said that we will never recognize Kosovo, I implicitly meant that we will not give up on our identity. This is something which defines us as a nation in the future. So this narrative of eternal non-recognition was um, sort of invented in this moment as um, a firm ground as something which can restore ontological security and which can alleviate uh, deep collective anxieties, um, you know, created by this act of secession. 
Serbia will never ever recognize Kosovo, whatever the price for that choice might be, was a mantra repeated not only by Tadic and Koštunica and Jeremić, but also Dacic, the opposition, and the um, most uh, most politicians which who, who wanted to um, come across as legitimate uh, decision makers in in the country. Whoever challenged this narrative or maybe proposed that Serbia should recognize Kosovo was immediately um, you know, labeled as a traitor, as a foreign stooge, as someone who is not patriotic enough and was um, quickly silenced or politically marginalized. Uh, now in this part, I wanted to share with you a few slides which uh, show very well how the public opinion thought about these issues because some people may say hey but these are nation nationalist politicians um how do the people in serbia think about it um, now all the research uh, corroborates and proves that um, serbian people um share those uh, you know highly emotional beliefs and um, ideas about kosovo now Somebody could ask whether this was generated top down by elites or elites only kind of uh, bandwagoned into a pre existing um, societal beliefs. It's a different sort of question and a very complicated one. But um, all research um, shows that uh, people were and still are extremely emotional about Kosovo. This is a research uh, conducted uh, last year in which, as you can see, uh vast majority of people agree that Kosovo is the heart of Serbia. It's another trope which uh, is, uh, re, you know, returning time and again that Serbia, that Kosovo is the heart of Serbia. It's part of our body politic, uh, which um, we cannot give up. Uh, we cannot negotiate. You can give a finger or a toe, uh, but you cannot give part of your heart because then you die. It, uh, kind of um, brings back the, the question of finitude. If we give up Kosovo, if we let Kosovo secede, then the entire state will collapse. Um, also, as you can see here, um, vast majority of people also agree that uh, Serbs have a historical right over Kosovo, that there would be no Serbia without Kosovo. Kosovo is the cradle of the Serbian identity and Serbian state, again, um, all, more than more than half of um, the respondents in Serbia agree with this statement. And also, when uh, pollsters ask people whether Serbia should recognize Kosovo, again, two thirds of the respondents agree with the statement that Serbia should never recognize Kosovo because this would mean sh national shame and humiliation. And these are the, 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 the responses which don't really change much. You know, if you, if you would compare um, a, a research from 2019 with the research from 2009 or 2001 or 1991, I mean, many of these things are extremely durable and uh, resilient. Now, this is the last part of my presentation where I discuss um, how Serbia and Serbian politicians cope with the fact that this Kosovo policy um, really uh, didn't fit into the Serbia's pro-European uh, you know, foreign policy. Because from 2000 onwards, um, Serbia sets uh, EU membership as one of its uh, foreign po pro uh, policy priorities, if not the foreign policy priority. And um, Serbia did many things in order to, to kind of uh, move on this path. In 2012, it obtained uh, a status of a candidate state and started negotiations in 2014. Now, on the other hand, uh, as you probably know, um, 24 states um, of the EU or 23 states of the EU at the time um, recognized independence of Kosovo. 
And the, although the EU does not have uh, an official position over the status of Kosovo because it cannot have one, it cannot agree upon one because countries such as Spain or um, Greece wouldn't, um, wouldn't accept. Um, all of the other countries, and among them are the, the, the most influential countries in the EU, did recognize Kosovo and clearly stated to Serbia, without the recognition of Kosovo, you guys will not be able to join the EU because we do not need another Cyprus. And we do not import countries with uh, territorial conflicts uh, inside the EU. We do not want to import instability. So you have to sort out with the Kosovo Albanians and with Pristina and uh, come to terms with, uh, with Kosovo independence one way or another. This is a message that Serbian politicians and Serbian public have been receiving for almost a decade now. Um, but um, this didn't change much um, in, in Serbia's um, behavior towards Kosovo. Yes, the EU started um, uh, the normalization dialogue it, as a mediator since 2012. In 2013, a Brussels agreement was um, you know, signed. Uh, it was hailed at the time as the historic uh, agreement. It uh, was never implemented fully. Some, some of the most important points actually about the, the association of uh, uh, Serbian municipalities um, have never been uh, implemented by the Kosovo side. Serbian side also did not impl implement some parts of the deal and it got stuck. Um, and uh, throughout this period, Serbia continued its counter secessionist policy and even stepped up its efforts to, um, to uh, prevent Kosovo from joining, uh, for instance, international organizations such as UNESCO uh, or Interpol. Also started, um, this is a very interesting, uh, relatively novel development, starting, started a, a derecognition campaign. Uh, Serbia basically managed to convince some 17 or 18 states to withdraw recognition of Kosovo. These are small states, um, no big important state have uh, withdrawn its recognition, but still psychologically it's very important for Belgrade and for many people in Serbia because it shows that this process of recognition uh, is reversible. Uh, up until 2017, over 100 states uh, had recognized Kosovo. Now the number fell below 90. And this gives to many people in Serbia and politicians hope that um, this process of international recognition of Kosovo is reversible and that uh, one day Kosovo might return to the fold of Serbia or at least better um, kind of um, Serbia will be better positioned to maybe negotiate a deal which will also include some uh, territorial gains in Kosovo. Now, both elites, political elites and uh, population at large in Serbia avoided to acknowledge the incongruence between Serbia's Kosovo policy and European policy. Um, I will just uh, show you two um, polls, one which was conducted in 2011 and the other in 2019, and you will see how things haven't changed. And uh, these polls um, clearly show the existence of dissonance um, and um, some sort of um, attempt of people to uh, kind of ease uh, the anxiety coming out of this dissonance by um, avoiding to, to acknowledge it. It's sort of a state of denial that the two are not really um, compatible. 2011, the question to people was, should Serbia join the EU? 59% said yes. Similar uh, numbers are today, as we'll see. When you ask people whether uh, Serbia will have to give up on Kosovo uh, if it wants to join the EU, then you see that majority of people see that, uh, yes, Serbia will have to give up. Uh, okay, th th there is only a minor percentage which totally um, agree. Okay, it's 33%, but when you add 21% who mostly agree, you see, you, you, you see that over half of the people um, are realistic when they're pushed and when they acknowledge that Serbia 
will have to give up on Kosovo if it wants to join the EU. But now an interesting um, slide comes. When you ask them what should the government of Serbia do, they say government of Serbia should never recognize the independence of Kosovo. So they know they want to join the EU. They know that it's impossible to join the EU if you don't recognize Kosovo, but you nevertheless want your government never to recognize the independence of Kosovo. Uh, the poll in 2019 repeated some of those insights. Um, and in this poll, questions were formulated slightly differently, but uh, the, the, the essence was there. Uh, the question was, do you think that recognition of Kosovo is a precondition for membership in the EU? 65% say yes. They are realistic. Um, they don't have any delusions that uh, this is not a precondition. Um, just a small footnote to this, politicians in Serbia rarely admit this, almost never. When you ask President Vucic or previous governments, uh, they will always tell you that uh, those are two separate tracks and that, uh, you know, Serbia have to continue both defending its territorial integrity and um, EU membership. But people are slightly more, um, you know, realistic when, when you ask them. But nevertheless, when you ask them, would you support the recognition of Kosovo's independence if it would be the precondition for Serbia's EU membership? 71%, almost 72, whopping 72% of people say no. So they do want to join the EU. They uh, agree that it will be that the recognition of Kosovo will be a precondition for joining the EU, but they still would not support the recognition of Kosovo independence if it was a precondition for EU membership. Um, as you can see, um, most of them still do support EU membership. Uh, Two-thirds of them consider recognition of Kosovo to be a, a treason, a national treason. So in conclusion, um, several key points. Um, as I've shown, ontological security is the ability of actors to maintain biographical uh, continuity. It is rooted in stable relationships with significant others, but also in ontic spaces, in material extensions of the collective self. Um, since the late 19th century, Kosovo has been, as I've uh, briefly shown, construed as Serbia's ontic space, as Serbia's core territory or ethno space, uh, the, the key uh, material environment in which um, national identity or narratives about national identity are anchored and root. Uh, its secession in 2008, its uni unilateral declaration of independence generated deep ontological insecurity uh, as Serbia was overwhelmed by fundamental questions of existence, finitude, um, biography and relations. To restore ontological security, Serbian leaders devised the policy of eternal non-recognition. We will never ever recognize independence of Kosovo because we have to be true to ourselves and to uh, keep the word and defend uh, national honor and dignity. Um, ever since there has been a cognitive dissonance between Serbia's stance on Kosovo and EU membership, uh, the EU countries and the Western nations Clearly, you know, we're sending messages to Serbia that uh, Serbia will not be able to join the EU uh, if it um, continues being rigidly attached to this um, nationalist discourse. Uh, politicians uh, try to cope with this through avoidance. They have uh, denied that uh, the two are um, incompatible and they have pursued the policy of both so-called both COSO and the EU. And the population too, um, you know, um, also have this uh, dissonant, uh, di dissonance between, uh, on the one hand, uh, their aspirations to become members of the EU, on the other hand, their uh, attachment to Kosovo. And uh, they're aware the two are um, not compatible, but uh, if they're push, pushed, uh, you know, to the wall to, to choose one between, between the two, uh, they, decide uh, not to recognize and to 
to stay outside of the EU. Um, this would be it for me today. I um, hope that you enjoyed the presentation, that you um, will be inspired by my talk. Unfortunately, we will not be able to have a, a discussion, but I invite you to um, read my book or read at least the paper which I shared with uh, Professor Belloni. And um, I hope to, to meet you sometimes in, in person as well. Stay healthy, take care, and uh, good luck. Bye-bye.